Hello, everyone. Um, so my name is Yi Ning, and I'm I currently working for um, Syracuse University. Um, I'm working as a director of research for Enormal Management. And for my work, for my current work, I um, perform various uh, data science projects that focus on the predictive modeling of um, the pipeline of the students' enrollment, uh, or recruitment, enrollment, and retention pipeline. And um, so I think my, uh, the focus of my sharing is about my formal life, um, formal pro professional life. So um, I, used work, I used to work in uh, pharmaceutical industry and also marketing for, uh, um, for seven years. So I worked uh, in different uh, data and analytics treatment department, including um, uh, marketing analytics, and before that, bioinformatics as well as biostatistics. That's a quick self induction Norma, do you mind? Can you hear me? Yes. Can you hear me? Yes. Oh, wonderful. Um, good afternoon. My name is Norma Palomino Graf. I am a former um, doctoral student, an alumni from Syracuse University from the high school. Um, I graduated from the doctorate in professional studies. Um, and I did my dissertation in natural language processing with um, Nancy McCracken. Um, uh, currently, I am one of the analytics and artificial intelligence directors in a company here in the Midwest called Cummins. Our company, um, we manufacture um, engines, diesel engines and power systems. And we are a global company, a Fortune 120 company that have uh, different branches globally. Um, in my current role, I am part of the, an office that is called Chief Digital Office. You may have heard that now is a new type of um, organizational unit that some companies have. They, are, they have divided the digital products part of the work from the Chief Information Office, the um, information technology systems part of the work. So I am in the CDO of, of, or Chief Digital Office. And there, what we do, we, uh, in partnership with business owners and subject matter, matter experts, we identify outstanding problems that traditional analytics techniques couldn't solve. And we use different artificial intelligence and advanced analytics techniques to solve those problems. Typically, manufacturing is Six Sigma. The most traditional technique is Six Sigma. We go beyond Six Sigma using um, algorithm, algorithm solutions in order to solve these problems. So that's my current role at Cummins. And I have around five teams with different type of data scientists and data engineers, software developers, project managers, et cetera. It's my pleasure to join today this panel. Thank you for the opportunity. Yeah, and then John, are you still there? And if so, are you able to, to do the same, please? Just kind of a brief overview on your role and then how you're using data science currently. Can you hear me now? Yes. Hey, so my name, my John Fox. I work for a small retail company. Uh, it is in the Fortune 150. Um, I think we're still in the Fortune 2. So I'm currently in our data science office down in Dallas, Texas. I did my PhD with Don Brown at the University of Virginia, 
focused on spatial temporal event prediction. After 20 plus years in the military, I wanted to do something different. Uh, Sue Corriera would not let me teach at the Syracuse University on campus. Uh, so I had to move to Northwest Arkansas and, and try to be a data scientist uh, with, with Walmart. And I'm currently with Sam's Club. All right, great, thank you. So um, question that came in directly to me to all of you, um, and it's been asked by, by several of our speakers, um, what do you think are the most important skills that a new data scientist should have, and if they don't have it already, um, they should look to acquire? Well, I guess I can chip in here. Um, I think in terms of the skill set, the data science have its foundation in um, on the technical side. I think have its foundation in uh, the statistics as well as the computer science. I think some of the speakers earlier today also mentioned about um, the general area of the computer science that focus on the machine learning. And then this one subset of the machine learning uh, called deep learning. And, um, and then by extension, there are also um, some uh, like Knowledges about uh, some of the more fundamental topics, such as uh, linear algebra calculus, and um, so, and obviously, database is also an important skill set. I think that those topics have or have been well built into the curriculum, so that's a great thing. Um, and on by, um, in addition to those uh, skill set, I think the ability to be able to communicate really well and also to be, to be able to team work with, um, with uh, domain experts. Um, I think that is also a key um, factor for uh, data scientists' professional life. So a question that just came in on the chat. Um, what are the technologies related to data science, coding languages, or software packages? Um, and ask which one is better, but I guess are, are there specific ones that you guys recommend that you're using more in terms of coding languages or software packages? Yeah, well, I guess I, I don't know if anyone wants to jump in here, but I guess I can start a little bit of the discussion on that. In terms of the technologies related to data science, coding language, and software package, uh, yeah, I, I see John, uh, John mentioned Python or C. So I think that's a good starting point. Um, essentially, um, in terms of the program language, so program language is a tool so it's used to achieve a goal. So I think that in terms of the choice of the program language, it will have a lot to do with the um, ecosystem of the working environment. Like what, what is the choice of the program manager or the team? And um, what are the code repository? Like what kinds of languages have been used in the previous code repository uh, that have been adopted by the team? So, I mean, for these two languages, if we com compare between R and Python, so they have a lot of the similarities. Both of them are um, dynamic uh, interpreted languages. So they are extremely high level. And uh, in terms of the learning curve, it's re relatively um, quick. Um, and uh, C, uh, like R, is probably more, um, it was developed as by the statistician and primary for the statistic, statistician at the beginning, um, but obviously it involved, now it, has, it provides support for um, a lot of the data mining machine learning tasks. Um, and Python is like studied as more of a general purpose programming language. So um, it later on provides the support for the data science and it's catching up really fast over the last 10 years in the field of the data mining, uh, in the field of uh, data science. So you have those um, packages, libraries, uh, such as NumPy, such as Pandas, 
uh, psychic learn carrots. So that support uh, the full spectrum of machine learning, um, deep learning. So that's why you are going to see um, a lot of the teams um, are using Python as well, particularly if you want to um, do the product uh, management, like they want to push out the full fledged product development. So they would use Python because they um, it can integrate better with the, uh, the for example, the web framework. So um, in terms of the technology, technologies, I think, um, I'm not sure exactly like what kinds of the technology um, are we talking about here. It, um, so maybe what, if it's the application of the data science, like technologies that are using AI, using um, a data science, so we'll be thinking about um, more of those technologies nowadays that focus on natural language processing as, as well as the computer vision. So I think the autonomous AI is the next big wave and that integrates a lot of the um, uh, computer vision technologies as well as the um, natural language processing technologies. Thanks, Ying. And Norma, do you want to go ahead? I see your hands up. OK, yes. Sorry. Um, I am muted. I, I can unmute myself. So I was trying to make a comment with the other question, and I couldn't. So it'll be great if the speakers can can stay unmuted so we can participate better. So thank you so much for unmuting me. Um, I want to uh, comment on the two questions. The first one, I really agree with Ying um, on the communication piece. Uh, it's essential for a data scientist to be able to communicate to the business in business terms. We will learn all the technical jargon that is essential for us to work on the profession and advance the career, um, our careers, but when you interact with the business, talking in terms of accuracy or false positive, false negative, you need to explain what that is and try to lower the level of jargon as much as possible. Otherwise, um, uh, it, doesn't, it doesn't become, uh, our work doesn't add the value that I should add. So. I will say communication skills, even as an instructor at Syracuse, I put a lot of emphasis on my students to, when they write papers, to discuss absolutely everything, not to make any assumptions that the reader understands how the technology works. Um, and also in terms of the business cases, because when you finish your algorithm and you show your accuracy, that's the beginning of a conversation. The business wants to know why is that useful at all? Is that 80% accuracy is not the goal. The goal is to solve a problem. So you need to learn how to solve a problem in business terms. And that is a learning curve. Um, talking about uh, performance, uh, downtime, uptime, bottlenecks in the case of manufacturing, for me was a learning curve. So this is, I wanted to make a comment about communication skills. And I guess it depends on where you wanna work on, where you wanna develop your career. If you wanna work on the, in, your, in the academia, you don't need to do this, but if you wanna work in a corporation, you must talk in business terms. Uh, regarding platforms, um, we do see an advance in platforms that are called low-code, no-code, uh, which are these platforms that require very minimum uh, programming skills. Um, in that sense, that is changing the way companies hire data scientists because they need, as Ian said, all the deep knowledge on statistics and algebra, calculus. They need that more than superficial knowledge and more programming because the new platforms, they have the programming. So um, it, I will say for, a, for the future, the impact these platforms have in our profession is that we will need to go very deep and proficient in statistics or know very well how to talk to the business because nothing in between actually is going to work. Thank you. Thank you for the time and for the question. So there was a question posed in the chat and it was actually the topic of um, one of the discussions earlier today. Um, and it was, is ethics a part of your job? 
So, you know, how does ethics in data science play into your job? Were you able to hear the whole question? Hey, I, I, hey sir, I can go. Um, so for us, we anything that touches our members and our customers where we're using the algorithm um, goes, goes through our, our – we've got basically two boards that deal with both the algorithm and the data. Um, so, you know, how do we do basically A-B testing on the fairness of the algorithm is, is an open research question. Uh, it, is, it is something that we focus on intensively uh, for anything that, that touches our members or our associates. Um, if, if, it's, if it's forecasting uh, sales, if it's forecasting um, or trying to identify replacement products um, where, where the member input or the associate input is not there, um, then it, it doesn't go through the same rigorous process. Um, the, the second side that we have is, I don't know that it's in the data science realm, but it's, it's, it's definitely highly correlated, is the data governance. Uh, so the components of data that are related to uh, any member of privacy, whether, whether it might be under CCPA, the California Consumer Protection Act, or any similar acts that protect uh, member customer data, the data science teams have to work hand in hand with that data governance element um, just to ensure we're being fair uh, and just to ensure that we're not using the data in a way that would cause us to lose the trust uh, of our customer. Um, but that's, I, that's probably as far as I can go on, on a non-proprietary call. But interested to hear from Dr. Grubb or Dr. Lynn. I agree with what you said, John. Um, I think maybe we need we do need to understand that uh, the ethical concerns are not related to the nature of AI. It's the way it's used, like as a tool, right? Um, um, it all depends how we train uh, machine learning models, the outputs that we will get from those models. So if the data scientist has a bias, the algorithm will show that bias because the bias is um, is reflected in the way the data was selected, in the way the features were weighted. Um, so it's just, I think it's very important to have an ethical discussion, but in terms of how these techniques as a tool are being used, not to blame AI for being unethical, so to speak. It's kind of, um, I'm not saying that we are doing it now, I'm saying you hear a lot of that kind of, those type of associations in the common knowledge that people have, that you know, all these AI is coming to um, do harm to all of us. And it's actually, it's just a reflection of human activity. And as such, a biased data scientist will have a skewed perception of how uh, the outcome of the algorithm will be and this, the, the um, technical decisions he or she makes to develop that algorithm will just reflect their own biases. Um, yeah, I guess I can trip in with, um, I think it's uh, important for building this concern for ethics um, at, at every stage, at every stage of um, any data science project in the real world. So I think I can highlight it. Um, I can highlight two examples. So one example focus on the data collection stage. Another example focus on the model uh, performance evaluation stage. So in terms of the data um, collection, data preparation. Um, so a big concern is given to um, the uh, imbalanced data sets where we have uh, maybe um, underrepresented uh, group um, in the data. So um, if we are doing a typical, uh, let's say, 
uh, randomized uh, sampling uh, in order to find the study population. So it runs the high risk of excluding certain type of the underrepresented group. And um, so that kinds of the, um, uh, data characteristics, inherent data characteristics need to be accounted for by the data science techniques to ensure that the project will be, um, will be uh, and the conclusion will be uh, fairly represented. And another one is about um, performance evaluation. So a big general approach for machine learning is, um, uh, particularly for deep learning, is to come up with um, um, what we call objective function. Uh, sometimes it's also referred to as the last function or um, it, it, uh, essentially, it's an objective function that we try to optimize on. And the absence of a lot of the machine learning algorithms, including deep learning, is um, um, about optimization problem. So it's uh, crucial to set up a right, um, well thought out objective function instead of just the one um, like single dimension metric that focus on certain type of the uh, uh, certain type of <laughs> certain type of the outcome. Um, so we need to build in uh, the consideration of multiple outcomes into this uh, into this framework, so that we can be sure that uh, the type of the project we are doing um, is fair and um, is um, has um, uh, have the ethical concern behind it. All right, thank you all. Um, another question, what are key challenges and pitfalls related to data science machine learning that we widely depend on today? What are your thoughts on data science versus fundamental exploration and discovery? Well, just to start, I will say, um, the challenges that we find every day at work uh, in data science project is data, is having enough data, having um, enough data that represents the type of phenomena we want to uh, analyze or predict or explore, and data in good quality. Um, as a data scientist, you will know very soon that you spend most of your time just working on data, cleaning the data, gathering the data, cleaning the data, making it ready. Uh, it's the most critical aspect of data science. You know, any any sophisticated, let's say, deep learning neural network algorithm is just a whole bunch of statistics. Um, put together in a system and um, run uh, in real time thanks to the superpower of computer machine right now. So um, it's a whole bunch of statistics. And as we say in statistics, garbage in, garbage out. So the, critic, the most critical aspect of an, um, a data science project is having good quality data. And I will say that's the most important conversation we have very often and the most critical factor for us to be successful every day at work in our data science projects. Um, and, and Jeff, I, um, I, I missed part of the question. Would you mind re repeating the question again? Yeah, let, yeah, so let, me, let, me, let scroll me scroll back, back up and find, up and find it. it. Okay, what are the key challenges and pitfalls related to data science machine learning that we widely depend on today? And what are your thoughts on data science versus fundamental exploration and discovery? Gotcha, thank you. So what kinds of the pitfall? Um, Yeah, John, if you want to go first, uh, I guess I need to. 
Yeah, I, I, I think I agree with Dr. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. I, I think I agree with Dr. Grubb that I, I don't know that there that there's a, a really great separation. I uh, I shared Leo Bremen's article, uh, statistical culture or statistical modeling to cultures, and I, I would encourage um, all the students or, or other faculty if they haven't had a chance to see that, just sort of read that article. Uh, it, you know, I, I think corporate America likes to draw a big line between, you know, hardcore data science and, and a data analyst. Um, but, and there, there's definitely, you know, there's definitely a transition point. There's definitely an evolution, but we, we all start with getting the data, scrubbing the data, exploring the data. Uh, even if it's a huge, large data set, we're going to take a sample of it to, to look at it. Um, I. I also agree with with Dr. Grubb and the pitfall is if if you're a data scientist and you've got a bias about the data, you can find it, right? And you and you can build an algorithm that just reinforces that. Um, and so um, the the other pitfall, I don't know if it's a data science pitfall or this is purely my opinion, right? Purely my opinion. I don't know if it's a data science pitfall as much as it's a, a, a corporate pitfall. And that's, you know, every once in a while you get a leader that walks in and says, you know, hey, could could I get an order of neural networks uh, with a large vanilla data science shake? And, and can you get me some of that artificial intelligence as a side? Right. And we want that to answer our problem. Um, and so you spend a lot of money, um, you know, to go build a quantum computer when really all you need is heaven forbid a pie chart. Um, so I, I, I think there's a pitfall that we use the buzzwords and, and we use the investment Vince, that one, that one phrase was for you. Uh, we use a bunch of investment where we might be able to solve the problem with a, with a little bit more simplistic approach. And I will stand by for Dr. Lynn to rebut me and, and show me the error of my ways. Uh -huh. Yeah. Well, I uh, I guess I can echo both Dr. Fox and Dr. Krupp's um, uh, points. Um, I think uh, there's, um, uh, for people in um, data science, um, when they think about the, um, the machine learning, when they think about the AI, so a lot of the thoughts, a lot of the priority were given to the data model in part. If we can um, approach these data science projects using this uh, process industry standard process of data mining. So starting with a good um, business understanding and then move on to data understanding. And um, there are a lot of things going to that step, which I feel is probably the step that is most underappreciated. So things like um, data pre-processing, data um, preparation, um, exploratory data analysis and, and a huge part of that ETA is the data visualization. Um, I think that that part, that step account for um, a majority part, part of the time and efforts in a real world data project. So, but that, um, that step has not been given a lot of the spotlight, but it's pretty much determined um, to a great extent of, uh, of the success or failure of uh, data science project. Um, so uh, so I, I feel like for people want to get into the fields, uh, they probably want to um, put in more emphasis on the step and as well as the step where we need to perform, compare the performance and fine tune the model. Um, but, but then of course everyone you know that the importance of not mod modeling part and then the importance of understanding and ability to, to carry out different uh, statistical learning, machine learning, deep learning uh, models. So I guess that part um, uh, does not need uh, for the emphasis. Um, sometimes people will tend to use um, overcomplicated model um, to, on a problem set that is not a good fit for the algorithm. So I'm specifically thinking about, so when we have a data that is not um, um, particularly large and with some kinds of the data quality issues such as the outliers, um, maybe in that case, um, despite all the hype, deep learning is not a good choice um, given 
the complexity of the model given the number of the parameters and then the difficulty of fine-tuning fine the hyperparameters. So maybe another uh, type of what we consider shallow learning come out to be a better fit. Um, um, I'm thinking about examples such as the ensemble learning, right? Like gradient boosting machine. So I guess eventually uh, it really have to depends on the, the situation about the about the data about the uh, about the problem sets that we are trying to handle instead of just um, just think of the most advanced uh, topic or uh, most advanced algorithm that is um, uh, popular like that is in the news right now and use it. I mean, not to say like deep learning is not a, a hugely important tool because it is. It's particularly good for the perception um, AI, perception um, type of the tasks, such as computer vision and uh, text data or natural language data. But for the more typical um, traditional record data sets, like in the business world, um, probably most of the time we write into the kinds of the record structure data. Um, and then if the size is not that big, so there are some other choices that can give you the better op outputs. That was great, thank you all. Um, another one that came in, what are the advantages and disadvantages of being an adjuncts, adjuncts professor um, specifically? Is it difficult to balance teaching and then your day job responsibilities? I think in my case, they tap into each other so nicely because um, and work I'm always talking about following Provinces in data science, and um, with the students, it's the same situation, right? So, um, just grading an assignment is very close to uh, giving feedback about a particular data science. And um, monitor together how the new new models are being developed, how new tools are being released, and test them out and bring um, lessons learned from one place to the other. So things that I learn at work, I can bring to the classroom and share with everybody. And the students always bring fresh new ideas that I can also use back in my everyday practice. So I think they really uh, tap into each other so nicely. Now, of course, when I have to grade, it takes some of my weekend time, etc. cetera. But that, that's, I will say, is the only time that I, I think, you know, it's a crunch time. Um, it's also the amount of classes, right? I always teach just one course. More than one course will be, um, will undermine the quality of the teaching if I do that. So I think they, they go together very nicely. Well, I agree with uh, with that statement, and I share the the similar sentiment. I feel like it's a um, it's a great experience um, um, to doing the um, adjunct teaching for the applied data science project, uh, applied data science program. So, uh, because this is something that um, I the uh, the kinds of the topics that um, we're teaching as adjuncts is, is, um, have a lot of overlapping with our professional life. So this opportunity of sharing what we, what we have learned and both um, um, from the theoretical side and from the applied side and share that with uh, our students, aspiring um, future data scientists or um, data engineers or um, data analysts. I think that is very satisfying experience for me. Yeah, maybe I should let the two or three students that are on the call for me answer that question. Maybe I don't want to know the answer to that question, but uh, I, I, I echo the the opportunity to share back and forth is 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 fantastic. Um, to to share some of the research that our company is doing in partnership uh, with people like Google, Microsoft, and Nvidia is is a way to spur the students. To, to focus on other things, uh, I, I think is helpful. I, I would be remiss though, I mean, at least the organization I work with, 
every once in a while the the pace of the organization and the things that are happening in the organization. Um, I think it hap it normally happens like twice a year, and I probably should shouldn't teach during those times. Um, for those of you that might have remembered March of 2020. Uh, the supply chain went a little out of whack in March of 2020, and it continues to today. Uh, and and that 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 makes finding that balance, Doctor Grubb, between grading and teaching and doing your day job. Um, you know, I, I experienced it last night. I'll probably experience it on the Wednesday before Thanksgiving again. So. Uh, <laughs> Thank you. Um, th this is for all of you. So are any of your companies creating quantum computer labs? And if so, how do you see that impacting your role as data scientists? Yeah, not for, for, not for me. So I guess I will leave these questions for Dr. Fox and Dr. Brock. Not in my case either. We are creating an innovation center where the, the, the team plans to start exploring those, but um, not yet. It's a very good question. It's a very good question. Uh, it got me thinking for after the call. <laughs> Thank you for yeah. the question. Uh, th thanks, Vince, for the question. We appreciate it. Uh, no yeah, I, I think I think the investment in that space for for a non tech company um, comes in partnerships with those tech companies. Um, and there's even not specifically with our company, but uh, the National Research Lab, Sandia, Oak Ridge, Livermore, uh, they actually have partnerships with uh, with corporate America to to do research in that space. Um, so, they, you know, I, I don't think you're gonna see a, a quantum lab in, in Northwest Arkansas, you know, over the next couple of weeks. Um, but I think you'll continue to see investment from corporate America into academic institutions, and you'll see investment uh, across corporate America uh, and with the national labs because Research has to be there. The investment has to be there, uh, but not everybody needs to build their own machine to start with. So another one that came in was some somebody who, them specifically, they were coming from a nursing background and asking if they had a place in data science. But I think we could make that question more general and say, you know, for really anybody coming from you know a non technical background. Um, you know, what are your thoughts on, on the place they have in, in the data science world and wondering if their previous experience or I guess lack thereof, um, you know, would mesh with making that sort of career change into the data science world? Well, I can check that. I think at this point with the advancement of technology to gather and store big data and handle big data, any professional will be touched by these technologies. Any professional will have a type of platforms that performs intelligence based on big data. So all what we call the subject matter expert, with, which is who you are, you're a nurse, so you're an expert in a subject matter that is related to data science, um, is essential for this, such as expert to become proficient in the technology. Right now, a comments what we are doing is to, we are taking a strategic move to train our engineers to learn how to build models. Because we notice that as the different tools to build, to build models become more um, easy to use, require less programming, um, it, it, the the penetration of artificial intelligence is bigger if we teach the subject matter experts how to use the tools instead of bringing more data scientists. We leave our data scientists power, brain power, for the more complex problems. But there is a whole bunch of small problems that you don't need a data scientist for. You need a subject matter expert. So in that sense, at this platform's advance, um, everybody at some point will need to be involved 
in some level of data science. So I think it's just a matter of having the technology close to you and um, start exploring because um, you will be affected by this like everybody is. So um, I think the, the, the relationship is closer than what you may think right now between your profession and data science. You just look around if you have a platform that you are using in your job and that's where your data science capability should be. Yeah, I, I agree with that. I think um, coming into data science with um, a domain expertise, that's a huge asset. I think that would also be, a, be the future of the data science and uh, more general for the, the future of the AI, because I'm thinking um, it will be AI plus kinds of the model. Um, so AI is used as an engine to power a lot of the um, applications in different um, domains. So um, if you have um, background in uh, 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 yeah, being a nurse in the past, so you work in the healthcare industry and healthcare industry definitely is going to be a huge area for the application of the data science and AI. It has already been in the past, but I'm just thinking about it's going to be the next um, break, uh, where the next breakthrough technology come from, given the, um, uh, the importance of the, of, um, of the industry. So far, I think the AI data science have been used a lot in a lot of other industries, such as um, particularly in technology. Um, but healthcare, it be, um, given its impact on everybody's life quality, so I think um, it's going to be a hugely important um, area. And there are so many problems that can be um, tackled using data science and AI approach. Uh, I used to, as I mentioned, I used to work for pharmaceutical. And um, so I work in multiple uh, data and analytics driven departments uh, that kinds of cover the different uh, life cycle of uh, a drug because I studied in the drug di discovery and um, I move on to the drug development. So that's essentially the preclinical versus clinical. And later on, when the drug that I was working on um, uh, was approved by FDA, so I moved on um, to be the uh, advanced um, analytics manager for, uh, for the drug, which is um, indicated for a type of the metastatic breast cancer. So I can definitely see, um, even though the type of the data that I used to deal with is extremely different, different like what it was um, for the job discovery phase, the type of the data we used to work on, focus on the unstructured data. Um, essentially those kinds of the data that you cannot put uh, nicely into a spreadsheet program, um, such as uh, Excel. Right, so there need to be a kinds of um, machine learning algorithms that, uh, that are good ways of um, feature engineering. And in addition to be able to deal with the high dimensional data. And does the same type of the data characteristics change, like change when we work in different the stages of these, um, these kinds of the funnel. Um, but as you can see that at different stages, there can be um, values value added to the um, to this business process eventually is to come out with the new job that can benefit the society. So this question is a little longer. Um, so if you need me to repeat it, please let me know. So at smaller companies, a data scientist might have to be a jack of all trades type employee. But at a lar larger organization, data science teams might have specializations within the, within the team. So how should you know, somebody best find the balance between being a well-rounded candidate and a specialized expert without narrowing or limiting their potential job opportunities? Wow, that is a very good question. And that is so true. And I will say we all face that question in our career because just 
building a digital product requires so many skills. Just the algorithm is kind of the core, is the heart of the system, but then you need the rest of the body, right? In order for the algorithm, you need an interface, you need data pipelines, you need all the software development to present it to the user or to, to put it in some type of application. Um, and it's an overwhelming decision to make. Say, okay, where do I go? Do I become a jack of all trades? which means that you're not deep on anything or do I get so deep on something that then I have only one type of job that I can apply to. I will say, I'm gonna be a little bit, um, um, it'll sound like a known piece of advice, but it's still real. Just follow your dream. What do you want to do? Because you don't wanna be a check of all trades that is unhappy. And you don't want to be, uh, you know, uh, data scientists specialized only in a particular type of um, aspect of data science, such as vision inspection or whatever. And uh, because the, the market is is hot on that, and then you're unhappy too. So I discovered throughout my career that just focusing 100% of what you want to do will bring the dream job that you're looking for not just trying to have the most wanted position. And I understand the anxiety because it's a very important decision, but in my experience, just trying to find what you really want to do, and even if it looks like nobody else is, does, is doing it, you will find that opportunity. So that will be my message. Sorry, it's not um, a secret sauce or anything. <laughs> um, but it is true that, for example, at Cummins, we have the, my teams are agile and they have uh, data, sci data scientists, they have data engineers, they have software developers, they have testers, and each one of them specializes in that little thing. Um, but I worked um, in other places in which I myself was a jack of all, of all trades trying to deliver to the business uh, from every single aspect. Um, um, it's a tough decision. And again, just follow your dreams. Well, I think it's, um, I, I certainly agree with that part um, from Dr. Rob about following the dream. And I think it's, uh, it's very important to, um, to make the decision based on your own interests and your own backgrounds. And you also have to do with what kinds of the environment you want to join, what kinds of, um, company you want to join. So if you join some of the uh, smaller companies uh, where maybe it's um, uh, for the whole data science group, it's only um, a few members. So I think it's imperative that you would know pretty much um, all of the things in data science. And um, so not just um, be able to get the data and analyze it and then come up with the uh, presentation PowerPoint slides. But you also need to know how to collect data, how to do um, um, data pre-processing, and how importantly, how to do the model deploy, uh, deployment so that uh, your end users can benefit from the product that you, de you develop. Um, and if you join um, a more established comp company um, and you have hundreds of the people working in data science um, function, um, such as Google, such as um, Facebook. And so there they are greater labor division within the department. And um, so there are job descriptions for different kinds of the roles, right? So it will be, uh, it might be data engineer or it might be machine learning engineer that focus on the algorithm optimization part, or it might be um, a data scientist, or it might be the product manager. And they all require certain um, set of the experience and expertise, but uh, those experience can certainly be gained um, data on uh, through uh, through project. So, um, so I would I would think that uh, focus. Uh, I think the high school have this um, uh, fantastic curriculum for the applied data science that build a pretty solid foundation for the graduates for the students graduating from the program. So they can go out and do a lot of the things. 
and um, and I think the only thing that that will remain unchanged is change itself, right? So we don't know essentially what kinds of the job will be there um, twenty or thirty years from now. Um, so um, with these kinds of the solid foundation, then also be flexible, also have this mentality of lifelong uh, learning, so that you will pick up whatever skill set that is required for the next generation of the job or next wave of the jobs, even though I don't always clearly see what kinds of the job will be um, 20 or 30 years from now. And lastly, so we only have about three minutes left. We want to be respectful of, uh, of all of your time. Um, so the last one would be, how do you all see the field of data science changing during the next five years? Well, I can start very quickly. I will go back um, again to what Dr. Liu said. Uh, just all the statistics, the kind of the hardcore statistics, algebra, calculus will increase because all the programming will become more popular and more streamline for uh, people in different, you know, for example, in, in a particular company like I work for, uh, the subject matter experts, in my case, the engineers, they will have tools at their disposal that they don't require them to write much Python at all. Um, so developing just the fact of turning a problem into and a statistical model will be the most core talked skill, along with the communication skill to explain all that to the business. Uh, I will say that's what the future is right now. Well, I, I, I think um, for the next five years, um, well, pro probably put, put this discussion in um, more of a uh, um, historical context. Um, I think for a while, data science have been trying to find its identity. Um, uh, like 10 years ago, there were no fields called data science. And, um, and then data science kind of wrong. So, um, so you will have like, I, my background, so my PhD was in computer science. And um, so my work focused on uh, um, computational learning theory and machine learning algorithms. Um, so when I look at the data science, um, uh, when it was still early days of the data science, I was thinking, oh, you call this data science. This is something that we have been doing for quite a while. And I think those statisticians coming from the st statistical background, they probably share the same sentiments about the, about the data science. So I think when we come along, we have a different um, few different community kinds of merge together. Uh, people from computer science, from machine learning, from AI background, or from statistical background, or uh, from mathematics background. And so they all come together. And now we, we kind of identify this core set of the um, knowledge or skill sets. Uh, we consider that is kind of important and um, almost necessary for someone who aspires to be a data scientist. So moving forward, I, um, I think it will be about how we apply the data science um, in the real life, how we add value, because this field is more like applied field. So the application of the, of the data science, uh, of the techniques that we learn um, will be hugely important. And that's why I'm thinking that uh, maybe looking look at the future, um, AI and data science is going to impact our society in a very fundamental way. And it's going to permeate um, different industries and have very significant impact. So, um, um, so for maybe for the next five years, a lot of the focus will be in that regard about uh, how um, data science, uh, machine learning, AI will impact different work of life and um, different professions. All right, well, thank you so much to our, our panel for joining us, Ying, John, and Norma. Thank you so much for taking time out of your 
very busy day between working and teaching and everything to, uh, to join us. That was really, really helpful and valuable. So thank you all.